Oh, I've got something special today. It's a real world upgrade. It's not just a build. We're actually gonna be helping with a real world computer. And the existing real world computer, the user's suffering a little bit. Let's, uh, let's dive in. All right, so a lot of the time people don't throw out their machine entirely and then just buy an all new machine. It's sort of a continuous upgrade cycle. So I happen to know somebody, let's call them Dewey, and they have a fabulously ancient machine. Well, parts of it are fabulously ancient. It's like the ship of Theseus. You know, it's like, how long have you had that computer? Oh, I've had that computer for years. Oh, that computer's only six months old. It's a Corsair carbide case before tempered glass was in vogue. So, okay, that's, that's pretty old. A pretty old CX750 power supply. It's based on the X299 platform, but it's got some problems. It's stuttering in games. You thought it was a heat problem, replace the cooler with a Noctua tower cooler. That helped some, to be sure. But here's the thing, it was working fine before he upgraded his GPU to a used 2070 Super from MSI. And then things got a little bit worse. Let's do a level one diagnostic and dive in at the workbench. Now I've got his system booted up behind me and oh boy, does it have problems. First, when I went into the BIOS, it said, the BIOS has been cleared and you should reset everything up. Which, you know, uh, Dewey said that that has been happening more and more regularly. So this is a 10 core 7000 series CPU. It's from 2018, so it's not really that old. And you know, 10 cores is still kinda a thing. This thing will turbo up to 4.5 gigahertz. All right, again, before we get too far ahead of ourselves, the name of the game here is Diagnostics. It's level one Diagnostics. That's what we've got to do here. So step one, clean install of Windows. Look, this machine has been upgraded over a period of time. Like the first incarnation of this machine had 120 gig SSD and I just won't let it go. It's like, Dewey, this is garbage. You gotta, you gotta let this go. All right, then we got the 970 Evo Plus. That's a little bit more recent. This is still a perfectly reasonable SSD. That's completely fine. So to do diagnostics, I've done a fresh install of Windows on another SSD because I don't want to erase everything and set everything up. The tools in the toolbox for that Hardware Info 64. This is a great utility that can read from the sensors on pretty much every motherboard out there. It will give you your CPU temperatures, your VRM temperatures, your GPU temperatures, pretty much everything across the board. And that's really good because, you know, one of the main complaints here is my games act weird and they're kind of stuttery. And that's since the new MSI Supreme, you know, 2080 or 2080 Super. And, um, that's, he's had that for like four or five months, six months, something like that. So that's that's the most recent upgrade and everything else sort of, sort of starts to go farther back in time. And you can tell that the oldest stuff here is that CX750 power supply and the case. The other tools in the toolbox, just Windows Task Manager for bringing that up. CPU-Z for running some basic benchmarks. Um, you can install MSI Afterburner, which is really great for capturing uh, benchmark utility. I've also installed OBS so I can do some screen captures and things like that, although you don't want to be running a screen capture while you're trying to do a benchmark because the screen capture software will eat some of your resources. We confirmed the CPU. It is a 7900X. It's a 10 core CPU. It's really good way back in the day. All 32 gigabytes of memory showing up, although at 2133 with basically garbage timings. But let me show you something, and this is crazy because it's got a Noctua cooler on it. It's a full tower cooler. And keep in mind that, you know, we're still rocking that 4.5 gigahertz, two cores, 4.3 gigahertz, four cores, that kind of thing. Oh, it gets kind of loud, don't it? Not only does it get loud, immediately our temperature shot up to 94 degrees C in the worst case scenario. That's some pretty severe temperatures. And, you know, he says it's not super unstable doing most things. It's just that playing a game, it stutters sometimes. It's not like it crashes, it's not like it blue screens. It's just not acting right. Uh, do you see it stutter? Oh, stuttered again. See what we can do with Hardware Info 64 running in the background is when it's done, we can check and see, you know, was that a thermal throttle? If the thermal throttling column is yes, or, you know, are there any clues? Sometimes there's not a lot of clues but sometimes there are. All right, 108 FPS average at 1080p high, 
22.2% CPU utilization, 74.3% GPU utilization. It's not amazing. All right, here we are with Tomb Raider, 1080p high. We're rocking an average of 121 FPS. Let's try 1440 real quick. All right, with our 1440p benchmarks, we're at 109 FPS, which is a little bit foreshadowing for the 1080p performance when we get the CPU upgraded, I think. Finally, we want to test AI in Civilization VI because, hey, that's kind of a CPU benchmark, right? I mean, that's what we're here for, benchmarking. Now, the full result is saved to a CSV file, but the average turn time, 8.06. Just for the sake of completeness, we will do a graphics benchmark as well. Average frame time, 9 milliseconds, with a worst frame time of 17 milliseconds, or just, just a little bit worse than 60 FPS, worst case scenario. And that is at our native 3440 by 1440 resolution on this particular test setup. All right, so you can assume that I've done all the usual stuff. I've tried to lower the CPU voltage. I've tried to check the thermal paste to see if the thermal paste was okay on the tower cooler because it's like, well, maybe you don't really need to upgrade. I mean, this is not a completely awful setup. And it's not that, you know, he just wants to upgrade. There's, there's a component of it that it's like, it's, it's time, you know, the system's from like 2018 or 2019, it's time. And it's kind of funny because, you know, that 2080 Super technically is from like 2019, 2020, but he was able to get it for like $500, which is a really good deal in this era that we find ourselves in of like GPU shortages and general insanity. <laughs> the previous GPU being a 1070, just a founder's edition 1070. So it's not a breathtaking upgrade. You know, a 3070 would have been a better choice or a 6800 or a 6700 XT. All right, so with the game benchmarks out of the way and seeing that, yeah, the system overall is kind of underperforming where you would expect it to perform with a 2080 when we're talking about resolutions like 1920 by 1080 and 1440 and 3440 by 1440, depending on what your particular monitor config is. Now, what he's playing on is 2560 by 1440, so the 2080 Super should be able to do that, but it is a 144 hertz monitor. The X299 platform is especially weak sauce for that, even with the 4.5 gigahertz clock. Now, the X299 platform gives you more memory channels, so even though it's 2133, you've got double the number of channels to work with. That helps offset that a little bit. We've also got tons of PCIe lanes, so if you wanted to run a lot of other peripherals for capture or display or whatever, you could do that. And I think initially that was the plan for this machine. Maybe run a dual GPU configuration, you know, that kind of thing. But, ah, uh, you know, 2018 was halcyon days of, oh, you could run two GPUs. That's not really a thing that you do anymore. So, looking at the rest of the system, it's like, what what do we got to work with? Well, I think this is, this is a, a Corsair carbide case. That's something that we can work with, but look how much front clearance we have with that 2080 Super. If I wanted to install, say, for example, a radiator in this case, it would have to only be a top-mounted radiator. I'm contemplating an upgrade to a Ryzen 5900X or a 5950. That's probably a pretty good upgrade for this system for a fast, responsive thing, but then we also have to get memory, which is unfortunate. I'm looking at the power supply, it's the CX750. Now the green label CX750s from Corsair, those are not amazing power supplies. Those are a little, little less than amazing. And this is an older CX750 power supply and certain power supplies and older power supplies can actually have compatibility problems with Ryzen. There's a BIOS setting that tries to mitigate this, but it doesn't do a perfect job called the C6, you know, typical idle current or low idle current. Some power supplies won't actually function correctly when the system draws so little power. That's how efficient Ryzen is, <laughs> sort of created some frustration among adopters. And it still is a problem that pops up on the forum every now and again. You get just the right combination of motherboard and power supply, even more recent ones, and the system can use so little power that it's perfectly fine under load, it's 100% stable under load, but then when the system is idle or it goes to sleep, it has trouble recovering, it's a little, it's a, it's, it's those intermittent problems are the really impossible ones to chase down. And so by switching to the Ryzen platform with this older power supply, that's something that I've got to sort of keep in mind. Because this is not a green label CX750, it's a little bit more recent and I'm less likely to have a problem. But if I do have a problem, I'm gonna to toggle that typical uh, idle current option in BIOS and that will probably make the, the, the problem go away. The other thing to consider with power supplies is that as they age, and 
as they've been abused and running at high load, you typically lose some capacity just due to natural aging. Now, Corsair is one of the better manufacturers. They really try to keep up with things. Uh, you're not gonna lose, you know, as much as you think you will in the higher capacity. It's the things that change or overcurrent protection and some other stuff like how the power supply is architected. So there are some benefits of having a newer power supply versus an older power supply. It's not truly an apples to apples comparison if it's a 750 from a few years ago and a 750 today. Even a really good brand, it's still not an apples to apples comparison. But the rule of thumb is basically you take 10% off the capacity for every two years that the power supply was in service. So this is a 750, I would take 75 watts off of that because it's more than two years old. So that would be, I could plan for a capacity of about 675 watts, give or take. Now real world, because this is a Corsair power supply, it's actually, you know, 700 watts, I think is probably a little bit safer. That is a rule of thumb and it's a broad strokes thing. And there's a lot of holes you can poke in that kind of an approach, but if you're more conservative with your power supply, generally you'll have a more stable system overall anyway. So 700 watts is about what I've got to work with on the power budget. Upgrading something like the GPU, you know, to like a 3080 or a 3070, that's really gonna push the older power supply in a way that I don't really want to do. Um, the Intel i7 CPUs, like, a, like the 10th generation, those are insanely dirt cheap right now. Like a 10700 or a 10850K plus motherboard, those are insanely, insanely inexpensive. Yeah, they top out at eight and 10 cores, but for gaming and everything else, a couple hundred bucks plus a board, plus another thing, you know, 300 bucks plus a board, that kind of thing, it's really good. Of course, those CPUs also like fast memory now because things have changed. So 32 gigs of 2133, not great. Now this is a 10 core, it's a 7900X, it's not garbage yet, so it could be sold. You know, 32 gigs of memory, motherboard, power supply, cooler, probably could sell it on Craigslist, something like that, two, three hundred dollars, maybe? Maybe? Like two hundred dollars is probably reasonable, three hundred dollars, eh, depending on where you are, maybe okay. So that's pretty good. And then our overall upgrade budget is like a grand. So it's like, okay, that's why I'm thinking, do I want a 5900X or a 5950? 5950, you get 16 cores, and it's gonna be a long-term system. It doesn't have the PCIe bandwidth of the old X299 system, but Dewey's not using it anyway. If this were you and you wanted to save a few bucks, I would wholeheartedly recommend the 5900X. You see, you got all the same cache, you know, that same level three cache, the two chiplet design, six cores per chiplet. It's really awesome. It's really awesome for gaming. Basically, a game can live on one chiplet, and then you can have everything else running in the background on the other chiplet. It's a pretty great setup. Now the thing with X299, the elephant in the room is, you could go to an 18 core. Yes, you could drop in the 10980 XE. 18 cores, it's a monster CPU, drops right into the X299 platform, and you're good to go. The problem is that we were looking around and they're kind of hard to get a hold of. I don't, the gaming performance isn't there for modern machines for high frame rate gaming, but if you're maxing out your GPU, it can be passable. So a 10980 XE adds eight more cores, and for the work stuff that Dewey's doing, not the gaming stuff, that probably would help to have more cores. So because, you know, he works the work and play kind of thing. Work from home, run simulations, do 3D, you know, that kind of thing. Depends on what you're doing. And a 10980XE replacing a 7900X, it's kind of a no-brainer. That is a good idea. But the sun and the moon and the stars didn't really align to make it obtainable to get a 10980XE for a reasonable price. So I think I've got in mind what parts we're gonna use now that the benchmarks are out of the way. Let's go to the workbench. All right, let's talk upgrades. I mean, the X299 platform was a flagship platform, 2017, 2018-ish. For a lot of PCIe lanes, a lot of connectivity. It was a hard choice. I get it. This is an easy thing to sort of waffle on. I mean, we've probably gone back and forth 47 times. It's like, oh, I should just upgrade a Threadripper, uh, you know, maybe. But for what he does, I don't think Threadripper is really gonna be all that beneficial. I mean, if you can make use of 12 or 16 cores, chances are you can make use of 24 or 32 cores, but it's a little bit diminishing returns, you know? And that 5900, 5950X is so much faster than a lot of things that are out there. Of course, there's also new CPUs on the horizon. Maybe it would make more sense to wait, but he's in kind of a hurry because his machine's acting weird. So here we are. 
this is what we picked. This is the B550 Gaming Carbon Wi-Fi. Now, I also had the choice of picking the X570 ACE from MSI, which has much better PCI Express connectivity, but it's also got a chipset fan, and X570 is maybe a little overkill, because it's like, okay, you're falling into the trap again of more and better PCI Express connectivity. What are you likely to add? A capture card, something like that? Well, guess what? This card's gonna do that fine. It's got a bunch of X1 slots through the chipset, and you can run, you know, another there's a physical x16 slot if you do get a higher end peripheral you can still use that but this is a more modern motherboard it's a little bit more up to date passive cooling also really inexpensive for cooling we have the rgb free as in no rgb mpg core liquid 240 this is a 240 millimeter cooler and a lot of the choice for this cooler was driven by what we're working with on the case because it's like well if we get a radiator that we can put in the front, that's not going to work with the 2080 Super because there's not physically enough clearance for that. But a 240 will work fine in that case. And he likes the case because it fits on his desk perfectly. It's not too tall, it's not too wide. And then picking another case, so in that case is perfectly fine and reasonable, becomes a little bit more of a challenge. The 750 watt power supply also factored in a little bit here because even though we're running the 5950X, that thing's not going to use more than 140 watts, guaranteed. That leaves the entire rest of the power budget for the GPU. So whatever comes after the 6000 series GPU from AMD or whatever comes after the 3080, if it uses 500 watts and it's not insanely huge, then that'll be a perfectly reasonable upgrade path. We know that AMD is probably going to change the socket, or at least we think we, we do, in the next six months to a year, probably more on the year side than the six month side. So again, this seems like a reasonable upgrade for, I have to have it right now, because all of this stuff is actually in stock. And finally for the CPU, 5900X or 5950X? My pick would have been the 5900X to save the 250 to put towards something else. But hey, this is an X299 system. Dewey likes to splurge a little bit. So he splurged for the 5950X. To be sure, we're gonna get the money's worth in the price difference with that 5950X. The way he looked at it was, well, we could just sell the old stuff and for what we're gonna sell the old stuff for, that's gonna make the difference for the upgrade. So it's a break even upgrade to move from the contemplated 5900X to the 5950X by the time he sells the old stuff. So we'll be looking at a couple of things in this upgraded build. How well does the cooling work? Is it a better situation in terms of fan noise? Do we get the full performance of that monster 5950X out of our relatively affordable B550 motherboard? There's a lot in play here. Let's put it together and see what our benchmarks are like. The first thing I wanna show you in this build is this Mag Core Liquid P240. Now this is a really interesting design because it moves the pump to the radiator. The pump is not in the CPU block. Something I've noticed is this This is not only available in a lot of local stores, it's also available in Best Buy. My local Best Buy has the RGB version of this, but there's not really a lot of difference between the RGB version and the non-RGB version. And at the time I'm filming this video, these are available for just about $100, you know, give or take $10, depending on if there's a sale or a bundle or something like that. Interestingly, these fans have rubber dampening mats pre-installed in the corners. After hearing the old machine, sure you think that he'll appreciate that, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you think? I will say that in an ideal world, it does work best if the pump is the lowest point in the system. But as a practical matter, we're not gonna be able to do that for this build. And here's our AM4 mounting bracket and our bag of AM4 mounting hardware. And then some, we should be good to go. Did I say B550 gaming carbon Wi-Fi? I meant the MSI X570 Ace. We went back and forth on the B550 Gaming Carbon Wi-Fi or the MMEG X570 ACE. The ACE is the X570 chipset which has a lot more PCI Express 4 connectivity through the chipset. The B550, you know, you still got 16 lanes to the CPU plus 4 for NVMe plus 4 through the chipset, but the chipset is really the difference between these two. There's so much more connectivity through the X570 ACE that it needs a fan, although we're starting to see X570 chipsets, you know, pretty late in the product cycle come out that don't actually require a fan. That said, the, the fan on the X570 ACE is nice and big. It's been pretty quiet in my experience. And it's like, you know, fan of MSI, can you tell? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's basically what's going on here. So the Meg X570 ACE or the B550 Gaming Carbon Wi-Fi, both of these will have no problem powering that 5950X. But for this system, for the upgrade, we're gonna use the X570 ACE 
because Dewey also decided that he wants a four terabyte NVMe because they were cheap enough, which blows the budget. But hey, you know, we're just wandering around Micro Center cherry picking stuff, I guess. Let's get building. Now we're gonna try to run the old 2133 memory at first. Don't worry, he also wants more memory, so we're gonna be moving from 32 to 64 gigs minimally. I do have a kit, a faster kit of memory coming that is also pretty high capacity, 64 gigabytes in two sticks. So two 32 gigabyte DIMMs. Two DIMMs with as much capacity as the four old ones and also faster memory clocks. How far we've come in five years. So yeah, we're gonna try that. How much of a difference does it make for gaming with the 2080 Super, an older GPU for this upgrade? I think it's gonna make a pretty decent difference at lower resolutions, but at higher resolutions, it's probably not gonna be that much. But we'll see, we'll run through the tests. All right, let's get building. We'll set this aside for now. It's build time. Or unbuild time, I should say. I have freed the old motherboard. It's really honestly not a bad system. I'm sure a lot of you guys would love to have a 10 core 7900X still with a reasonably modern X299 motherboard. I mean, it's a pretty solid motherboard. You got dual LAN and it's even got the USB type C front panel connector. So this is like one of the later models. Our X570 Ace from MSI is gonna be a pretty easy install as well. Basically uses the same screw holes. Now in anticipation of installing the radiator, I'm gonna go ahead and take out the fan in the top because that's where our radiator is gonna go. The top fan that's currently in there is 140 millimeters and you can see it does not have appropriate clearance. A lovely 140 millimeter Corsair fan. I'm sure we'll find another use for that somewhere else. All right, I think that's gonna work pretty well. So the next thing is to set this aside and mount our fans to the radiator. Right, so this is gonna be mounted in the top either like this or like that. Could go either way, really. Now we've got three connectors, one for the pump, two for the fans. The kit does come with a nice Y cable, so most motherboards have a pump header and a fan header, so this will work out perfectly if you use the Y cable so that one fan header controls both fans. A nice little detail is if you would rather have your pump uh, power cable exit at the opposite side of the radiator, there is a uh, slot cut for you to do that. So you could just pull the wire out and put it on the other side, depending on how you've mounted your radiator to hide the wires. What I really love about this mounting system is that it uses the standard AMD clips. And that's gonna make it ridiculously easy for me to swap around CPUs if we need to, troubleshooting, diagnostics, whatever. Now remember the final setup before the system goes home is gonna be a couple of SATA SSDs and an M.2 and brand new four terabyte M.2 connected to this. But I set up a separate install of Windows on a test SSD just so we could get some baseline numbers. Anytime you're helping a friend troubleshoot, you know, it could be Windows, it could be their settings, it could be their BIOS, it could be any number of things. So step one is uh, we're gonna reuse that old memory like i said we'll get that installed to get the gpu put back in get the test ssd in and first order of business is run benchmarks but actually just before that you'll also want to make sure the bios is updated on the motherboard copy it to a usb stick and uh, flash the motherboard to be sure that it's the very latest version it might post but uh you're going to want to update the bios now word of caution here a little bit because with the 240 millimeter radiator, there's actually less RAM clearance than I thought. With our completely bog standard ancient memory, the height clearance is no problem, just barely. But if you had really tall memory, the first fan on the radiator would interfere with it a little bit. The, the radiator would have to be mounted a little higher and it'll probably vary from case to case, but it's a really, really close fit in this particular Corsair case. At this point, our system's basically together. Other than updating the BIOS, the next things to test are how much of a difference does the memory speed actually make when you've got this? You know, was it necessary to upgrade to faster memory? 64 gigs OLOY kit is what we're gonna try in here. That is 3600, so we do get the benefit of the faster infinity clock speed, but uh, the timings on that kit are not as fast as say a higher end G-Skill Trident Z kit, but that also costs more. So we'll see. Good news, everybody, it boots. 
it's detecting our 5950X processor correctly, as well as the fact that we've got 32 gigabytes of 2133, but 32 gigabytes installed in the system. Well, I've got the system set up once again, another fresh install of Windows. That's how you got to do this. And the same toolbox, Hardware Info 64, CPU-Z, OBS for recording, mostly for y'all, and reinstalled all the games. Yeah, I know, just baseline testing. Bear with me. Hardware Info 64 shows much more reasonable temperatures. We have not enabled PBO or anything like that. We haven't done any overclocking. This is just the out-of-the-box performance. For the CPU-Z multi-core score, we're at over 12,000, like 12.2, 12.3, something like that. And that's with our 2133 memory, our pokey 2133 memory that's just just barely clocking along. Now, the timings are pretty good on it. Well, no, it's not, actually. It's like 15, but that's not... Could be worse, could definitely be worse. And our peak CPU temperature with that all-in-one is only 57 degrees C. Hardware Info 64 also shows us that our 5950X is clocking at 50, uh, just over five gigahertz. 5.05 gigahertz to be exact. It's nice, very nice. And we've got our first result. 156 FPS at 1080p, even with our, you know, relatively pedestrian 2133 memory, 32 gigabytes. We're GPU bound 43% of the time now, instead of 7% of the time. Ah, that's more like it. That's what we like to see. Average FPS 117, and 99% of the time we're GPU bound. This is in 2560 by 1440. 117 FPS though, remember our target's 144, 1440p. We're doing pretty good, and that's on high settings. We can always drop it down just a little bit more. Let's try Wildlands. Now remember when we were going through this scene initially, there were a lot of hitches and stutters and just general weirdness. I don't know if that really shows up on camera. There's been a stutter or two in this, but subjectively it's way better. And spoiler alert, we've actually already been playing a lot of games for a few hours, and the subjective experience is way better uh, since we've changed the CPU. 133 FPS, 13.4% CPU utilization, 93% GPU utilization. That's a 1080p high. Let's try 1440. 107.8 FPS average, 13.4% CPU utilization. Not bad. Let's see how Civ does with this monster CPU. Average turn time, 7.33. That's a pretty big improvement. This is the graphics benchmark. Let's see how much better that does. Average frame time, 4.8 milliseconds. And the 99th percentile is 9.5 milliseconds. That's a pretty substantial improvement as well. And finally, here is our OLOY memory upgrade kit, which you might remember from other past videos. This is two 32 gig six, 60, uh, 3600 C18, 1.35 volts. This is not super tall memory and it's angled on the corner. So it's just barely gonna fit in this case. Let's swap this out and then do some more benchmarking. Now with the memory installed, the BIOS will reset, don't worry. You can go back into the BIOS and reconfigure any appropriate settings. Now the memory we were using before didn't even have an XMP profile, but most of the memory that you would get today will have a memory, an XMP profile, so you'll at least need to turn that on. It's like, oh, devices have changed. They have indeed. While I'm in here, I'm also gonna configure the fan profiles. With the XMP profile set, that's literally the only material change that we made, and then I turned on automatic mode for the other fans. You can hear it ramps up and down, but mostly it stays down and the ramp is much slower. Ooh, the plot thickens. 64 gigabytes of memory that's 3600, but not the best timings. 153 FPS at 1080p, 90% GPU bound. And here we are at 1440p. 106 FPS, GPU bound 100% of the time with our 64 gigabyte kit. Civ 6, AI turn time, 7.37. For the graphics, not much of a change. 4.67 milliseconds uh, for average, and a 99th percentile is 9.1 milliseconds. So for Wildlands 1080p, we're looking at 126.53 FPS, 11% CPU utilization, 91% GPU utilization. 98 FPS at 1440p, GPU bound 94.3% of the time with 12.9% CPU utilization. Not bad. Now the OLO memory out of the box not super impressive timings, you know, 18, 22, 22, but fortunately MSI has Memory Try It in the BIOS, and Memory Try It 
Okay, 3200 didn't work, but 2800 did, because we got decent results with 2133. So at 2800, with really tight timings, now I can do 164 FPS at 1080p with 64 gigabytes of memory. So there you have it, walking you through my thought process. Now I know it seems like a slam dunk to take one of those 18 core X299 CPUs and shove in that motherboard, but I think the usable lifetime of that, unless you're doing 3D rendering or something that's really gonna use the 18 cores more than high performance gaming, uh, you would enjoy upgrading to something else other than X299. Plus, right now is a great time to sell X299 because there are a lot of people that have X299 and are looking to upgrade. If you wanna see more what if content like this, ask more what if content like this on the forum, but you gotta post a lot of pictures. So I've got something to talk about in the video. It's like, this is what I've got, this is what my budget is, this is what I'm contemplating for an upgrade. Might be good stuff. If you like this content, definitely let me know you wanna see more of it. I'm Wendell, this is Level One, I'm signing out. And you can find me in the Level One forums.